In Acts chapter 15, you had delegations come from different parts of the world about an issue that changed the future of the church. What was the main issue? What were the sides and how was it resolved? Find out on this episode of Inverse. Hey everyone, welcome to Inverse here. We have a really big topic at hand. We're in Acts chapter 15, so if you are watching or if you're listening, make sure you have your, your I guess you want your Bibles out, but if you're watching, if you're listening on podcasts, you don't want your Bibles out, you might be driving. But anyway, get the script before you in some manner, and we're going to discuss this here amongst our friends. We've been preparing for this. This is a big episode. There's a lot of issues. I'm pumping this up a little bit bigger than it needs to be, and he's looking at me a little bit anxiety. <laughs> so we're going to have word of prayer. Anxiety is going to go away, and we're going to have a really good discussion. So I'm going to ask uh, Kelly, can you pray for us? Yes, let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of your word, and we thank you for uh, recording the different parts of history that we may learn from them. We pray that you'd guide us by your Holy Spirit and that we would leave better equipped by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's read from Acts chapter 15, and we'll go to the apex of that passage, which I'll be in verse 11. And uh, let's see, Jared, can you pray? For, uh, can you read that for us? Yeah, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Okay, so we've been in the book of Acts, and kind of we're, we're, we're tracking along from chapter to chapter, and finally in chapter 15, about the midpoint of the, of the book. And Israel, what's going on? How, how are we here for those who are maybe joining us for the first time, yeah. or maybe they've heard this a billion times, but they just want to yeah. track with us? So the book of Acts is more than Acts of the Apostles, is the Acts of the working of God, the Holy Spirit. It starts off with, in chapter 1, with a small group of people, who receive this command from Jesus Christ that they're going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even in the whole entire world. Mm -hmm. The question is, how in the world are they going to accomplish this enormous vision? How can they accomplish this huge mission? Well, then Acts chapter 2, as they're praying for God to work in their lives, as they're ironing out their uh, interpersonal relationships, and as they're seeking God's uh, blessing and his grace, the Holy Spirit falls mm -hmm. upon them. They receive the gift of tongues. They're able to communicate, even though they're a small group of people, uh, mostly uneducated. They all of a sudden have this ability through, uh, you know, supernatural spiritual supernatural uh, gifts from God to spread the message to the entire world. Church explodes. Church explodes. International. And then all of a sudden you have instant success. Mm -hmm. That success will continue to grow. Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, all of it's going to just continue to grow. Satan is going to attack the church through mm -hmm. internal opposition, external opposition, focusing on ourselves, what we don't have. But the grace of God is going to be blessing the church, giving it more and more success. The church will be unstoppable, and that's what we see. We see an unstoppable church all the way through. Finally, Satan launches one of his greatest attacks by killing Stephen mm -hmm. uh, in you know, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8. And even then, that can't stop the church of God. It's like the Bible defines that moment as just Stephen sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so nothing that Satan can do can stop the church of God. And as it continues to grow, Paul begins, is introduced, he's converted from this, you know, antagonistic approach to Christianity, persecutor, now persecutor murder. The... Now he's one of the main figures. Mm -hmm. And then we now begin to switch figures between Paul and Peter, Paul yeah. and Peter. And so we finally reach Acts chapter 15 which now discusses challenges that arise in the church. And it's critical for us to understand the fact that in the book of Acts, we see the interplay of divine and human interaction. Mm -hmm. As much as God is present, so is humanity present in 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 the in the working like of we're the seeing church. here this this uh, this apex almost of this this church growth is chapter 15 and there's a council coming this is called the Jerusalem council it's a it's a it's a natural debate I guess would arise mm -hmm. yeah. because it's there's a there's a lot of stuff happening mm -hmm. and the one thing that, that that I really appreciate is that in the early church not everything was so hunky-dory uh, yeah. I don't it was know. a real church. It had real issues. Yeah. It was and, real life. You know, I, I always see that when something's going forward, 
uh, in terms of the law of physics, there's always going to be friction that goes backward. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have friction that goes backward, then you're not really moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but, in, but as you're saying, from the perspective of God, friction is not really that friction. It, he's it's, not it's, afraid. It's, God it's, it's is not, not afraid of friction. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. it's not going to impede the world. And, and it's important for us to understand, too, that the, the, the friction is a result of growth. Mm -hmm. And so, in reality, we get to choose what kind of friction we will get yeah. involved in. You know, we can have friction as a result of a lack of work. You know, there's not, there's no mission moving us forward, and so we're going to focus on ourselves and mm -hmm. start, you know, getting. Well, let's actually get into yeah. the the council uh, narrative itse itself. Let's go to chapter 15, verses one through five. And Jared, can you read that for us? So we kind of get yeah. a, a perspective. So, here. so here's the friction. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the, bre the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so in its core, Jared, what is the actual issue that's going on here? Well, it's a dispute over not just ethnicity, but um, the practices within these two different groups you had um, up until chapter 7, um, the church growing amongst uh, Judaic believers, among the Jews. Mm -hmm. As that gospel is, is the official mouthpiece of, of that group, the Sanhedrin, rejects Stephen, the gospel begins to push out and, and Gentiles come in. Paul goes out and he's preaching in a synagogue. Gentiles are gathering around. They're saying, we want to hear this message too. So the church is being flooded in with a group of people that it's never had to deal with before. And it's asking these questions. How do we relate to these people? How do they so relate to us? These are questions that they did not think of before, but now with the growth, these are new issues that are coming up and they have to wrestle with, yeah? Callie, can you ask, can you answer, like when, when, when there's conflict, like how do we, as, as a corporate body, as a group of people, uh, what are some principles we can we can we can abide by to help with resolution that we found in yeah. really embodied in this passage? Yeah, I think one is actually in verse five. Okay, um, it says, "But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them." So they're focusing on circumcision, but it's like, who is that? It's the Pharisees. Yes. Who believe? So the Pharisees are the people who always fought with Jesus because he broke the Sabbath, or he. Yeah, he healed people, and that was bad, and he was preaching against the law, which really was filling the law. But anyway, so these are people who are obsessed with the law, mm -hmm. and knowing that about them, it helps us kind of understand where they're coming from. Uh, I know for me, when I read through the Bible and I sometimes see the Pharisees, I just kind of write them off, like, oh, yeah, they're the jerks. Like, they're the bad people, <laughs> but and, and, and kind of a way they are. But also, like, they did believe, so they did come to know Jesus. And so in resolving conflict, it's important first not to just write people off because mm. we don't like what they say, but, like, why are you saying that? Why? Why do you think that we have to be circumcised? Well, because you're a Pharisee and you've literally been indoctrinated in this since you were really little. Mm. So instead so of we do you do off, that today, we yeah. do we do label sides and we yeah. we write them off, saying that if you're of this label, you must believe everything here and you have all the negative connotations yeah. associated. And I think about it sometimes like in the church, you know, we work with different people that we're, we're all saying they Adventists, but like, well, they're liberal. That's mm -hmm. why they think that. they're conservative. That's why they think that. Mm -hmm. But we don't actually meaningfully engage with them because we write them off mm -hmm. based on where they go to church or based on certain words they use. And that is, that only breeds conflict and dissension. It doesn't actually remember that we're one family at the end mm -hmm. of the day. There's, there's, Israel. you know, the Bible clearly outlines here what the debate is. And what I love about this passage is it gives us clear insights. What is the issue that they're addressing? And then they also provide pretty awesome principles on how to address those issues. Mm -hmm. The principle here that they have, or the issue that they have is found in verse 1, that salvation is found according to the customs of Moses. 
Mm -hmm. That's that's the bottom line issue that they're coming is like, hey, you have to follow the customs of Moses in order to be saved. That's the de that's what the debate is over in cha in uh, verse one of chapter fifteen, and then it says in verse five, it 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 you know expounds on that. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, and now here's the other point, that it is necessary to circumcise them, back to the uh, customs of Moses, and to command them to keep the laws of Moses. Mm -hmm. So now you have an issue of the people are saying, this is how you receive salvation, number one. That's what, one of the reasons why the debate is taking place. And number two, because I am commanding you to do something. So now I'm enforcing my belief upon someone else. So these individuals have the belief, this specific belief, and they're saying, look, because I have this belief that you need to keep or that I need to keep the laws of Moses, you need to keep the laws of Moses too. So I am going to enforce my will upon you. And so this is what the debate has kind of risen from. It's risen from the fact that people want to impose their own spiritual experience on someone else. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that through custom, you can be saved instead of through the blood and the grace of Jesus. Like Christ. I'm getting two principles here. One, I really appreciate it, Callie. I think what, what I can extrapolate even more out is we need empathy for the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need not just sympathy, which is just oh, like, like uh, feeling sorrow or uh, the but feeling. I get, but I get where you're coming from. But actually living in that person's shoes and seeing it from the, uh, that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then from what Israel is saying is really, it kind of seems like an, uh, an issue of where their authority is coming from, what basis of texts, and if that should be imposed upon another. Where, yeah. where is the basis of, of reality coming right. from? Or my, because the issue, and this happens all the time, what these Pharisees are saying is they're imposing their experience on someone else. Mm -hmm. And we do that all the time as well. Like, hey, if you want to be a part of my religion, you got to go beyond what the scripture says to, you have to act out and live out your religion the same way that I live it out. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're a little bit sketchy. You know, I don't so know the if basis I can of unity becomes on on my standards, yeah. not on a collective standard. Okay, that, that's that's true. Okay, but I'm going to push back oh a little no. bit oh no. because <laughs> circumcision is kind of a big deal. Like yeah. this is part of the covenant that God made with Abraham from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Like if you jump to Exodus chapter 12, you can't take the Passover unless you're circumcised. Like this is a significant sign of whether you're part of the faithful or not, whether you're like in group or not, whether you're a part of the, 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 the believers mm -hmm. that are, are taking the Passover on the exodus out of Egypt or whether you're one of the deniers. This is significant. So it's yeah. not like we're just saying this is an imposed uh, yeah, thing or Pharisees yeah. or oh we're blast these guys. There's serious <laughs> stuff that we need to All discuss. Right, we're here. sensing a little tension here at the circle <laughs> here. Maybe there's not gonna be another Jerusalem council here at Inverse. Council. We'll hear a little bit more from what, what Jared has to say after the break. Hey, welcome back to Inverse. Maybe you were sitting with bated breath and seeing what's going to happen here. I'm scared. Uh, J Callie is, is, is scared. got these big eyes. It doesn't work. Um, is, uh, Jared, what's, what's going on here? Yeah, I was just saying, you know, is, uh, uh, Callie Blasty people, they're being Pharisees in Israel. I don't know what he was saying. It was important. It was good. I agreed with him. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, this is a sticky issue. It's yeah. not clear cut. It's not yeah. like this is a practice that was in place for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, it was always a part of their of their religious identity, their religious practice. So, so one side wants to do this, away. and I get that. Well, the other side doesn't want to do this. Have we have we talked about that? Why why doesn't the other side want to do this? Well, it's an issue. Is it of, just merely yeah, the pain factor? I think I think it's an issue of salvation. These people are saying this is the only way that you can be saved. So that brings a lot of questions into the picture. Like if this is the only way you can be saved. So the act of circumcision has nothing to do with it. It could have been as easy as like you got to put a, a, a ribbon around your finger. Yeah. yeah. And and and, and right. this, this issue would still have arisen. Are you complicating salvation or not? Okay. How, the yeah. question is how are you saved? I mean, that's the yeah. issue. How are you saved? Let's go back to the text and let's actually finish, uh, not finish, but let's get more into text. Jared verse 6 onwards there. Uh, now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. 
Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we Mm. were able to bear? Mm. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner uh, as they. Can I read from verse 12 to 14 of chapter 15? Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Skip down to verse 18, Israel. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses had throughout many generations uh, those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. All right, so let's fill in the gaps here. What's, what's, uh, what are the sides of the debate and what are people saying? Translate this for us. Jared? Um, the sides of the debate, well, you have people, as we've already discussed, um, the salvation uh, that comes, they're the merit, I guess, that comes through circumcision. Mm-hmm. But then you have the church kind of working through this issue, and they're saying, well, God called us to reach the Gentiles, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, we're, they're telling stories. Peter here is going back and, and telling his story of, of Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius and God. They start speaking in tongues. God gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying God is moving among these people. Paul and Barnabas, they start telling their stories of what God is doing. Mm-hmm. And that creates a, a touchstone, not only experience, and I think this is important, but they're looking at, at, at their their experience and what God is doing, but then they also go to the scriptures. And uh, we didn't read this, but it says, After this I will return, I will rebuild the tabernacle this of David, which has fallen 15, down. Verse 15 16 verses 16 and 17. 17 mm-hmm. That the rest of mankind may see the Lord, even the Gentiles who are called by my name. Mm-hmm. So there's a biblical foundation. There's experiential there's also the providence of God in opening this work. So they're pushing back right, and they're so saying, different strands of argument coming in, this? experience and scripture. Kelly? I think that's just beautiful that their argument doesn't come down to like fighting. Hmm. It doesn't come down to like, well, no, you're uncircumcised. Well, you're too straight laced or whatever. But they're like, okay, like we need to actually break this down. Mm -hmm. So Paul and Barnabas first, they try to, you know, uh, talk to the instigators about it. That doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So they go to a general council and they talk about it. And as Jared was saying, they share their experience. But I love that they still come back to the Bible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's not just like, well, we kind of experienced it. So whatever with the word of God. Mm -hmm. But James actually comes like, okay, guys, like it's an Old Testament. Okay. Like this is, this has been there from the beginning, even with Abraham and everything. Like, this has been there for a long time. We just haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. So we can bolster these experiences by the word of God, not just stand alone. Mm-hmm. And then they actually get consensus and write the letter later mm-hmm. on. What's, what strikes me is the response of how the dynamics, the social dynamics are taking place among the people, um, among the people who are disputing. Mm-hmm. Number one is Peter recognizes and he points out the people that we are talking about are clearly chosen of God. Mm-hmm. Number one, these are people that are chosen of God. And so it's important for us, I think, when we're dealing with debate or, or when we're dealing with differences that w- we have with other people is acknowledge the person that I'm talking with is, is someone that has God. been chosen mm-hmm. from God, right, mm-hmm. by God. And then number verse 8 of chapter 15 tells us that God knows the heart. So there's an acknowledgement in the conversation. At the end of the day, there are certain things that I don't have and that is an understanding of the heart of the person that I'm, that I'm speaking with that God does know. So God knows the heart. The other thing is that God acknowledged these uh, Gentiles. He acknowledged them by giving the, the Holy Spirit. And so I think that... Which I think is interesting. He just, and then the, the phrase after that, just as he did to us. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's no differentiation between right. us. We're exactly the right. same. Yeah. And he brings that up again uh, in the next verse. And I think that when it, when it comes down to... Um, when it comes down to the debate and debating with other people or, or, or trying, to un, trying to resolve issues with other people, I think it, it, it gives us here a principle that is beautiful, and that is we ought to try to put ourselves in the place of the other person. You know, hey, the other individual has 
ultimately is very much like me, right? God can use someone else just as much as he can use me. And so there's an acknowledgement that there's no distinction between me and the other person in the same manner, verse 11. And then verse 12 to me is the climax of it. It says, then all the multitude kept silent and listened. Mm. And I feel like, man, this is such valuable, rich counsel that as these people are building their case, they're not being interrupted or they're not being, yeah. uh, you know, challenged, but they're sitting back and they're, they're keeping silent and they're listening to the perspective of the other person. And it says, and verse 13, and after they had become silent, you know, after they, for a period of time, listened to mm -hmm. the case that the other people were building up, then they you know, had the response that they had. And so this we doesn't have only seem principles. like principles for like corporate uh, conflict. This is also for interpersonal one on one conflict. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I love that uh, there's we talked about empathy, but also listening. This seems like there's active listening going on. This isn't just passive waiting for one person to talk. And that's my turn for the debate. And I'm just going to talk at the person. I, there's actually active listening going on and, and trying to understand the other side. Kelly. I'll say there's just also just a willingness to have their minds changed mm. because this is, you know, as Jerry was talking like this is a really big deal it's like foundational to their culture and the fact that they're willing to be like okay I will listen to your experiences and not just yell over you because that's all I want to do mm -hmm. and they did end up you know coming to a consensus and changing their mind so even going into something with empathy and like okay I'll listen to you and just listen to you whatever but like, I'm willing to be wrong and you might actually be right yeah yeah. I mean, I remember one time in, in, uh, in, in, in talking with my wife, I mean, <laughs> these are one of these marital situations that we have, <laughs> yeah. there's this desire to just talk over and just justify, even though you may even be the person in the wrong. Yeah. And I'm not going to say whether I was in the wrong or my wife was wrong. Was my wife we knows, all know that my you wife knows what the, the real situation <laughs> is. But, but <laughs> just to, right. to, to defend and defend <laughs> and defend. <laughs> and so listening just because it's an innately selfish exercise mm -hmm. to listen passively. Mm -hmm. Just to just like to, take a breath and then take, I'll, yeah. I'm going to say my point. Yeah. Like I just did to you. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beautiful example. Of Amen. There you go. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, an interesting <clears throat> issue because you have church growth but also not just in, in numbers, but through process and the establishment. I mean, this is a significant church council, but the church growing in uh, policy, growing in um, their, I think, maturity and how they're dealing with real issues. I mean, not just as a bureaucratic -cratic policy, but an actual a deepening of church administration in, 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 in important matters. Yeah, from yeah. a spiritual yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and here's the thing if they were still in Jerusalem, they would never have had this problem. Mm. But because they were passionate about the gospel, because they were sharing it, this is this is a conflict that comes in mission. So, you know, we can we can have our own beliefs from Scripture, and we can sit in our cozy houses and and read them or whatever in our the comfort of our own country. But a, a passion for Jesus necessitates this intercultural interaction. Um, even with people that live next door to you around the corner or yeah. in the office. And that is going to create some tension with things that I believe, presuppositions that I have that may, will draw me back to the word of God to say, is this really important? And maybe mm -hmm. I find, yes, it's more important than I ever saw. Or maybe um, there are more important things in these views that, that I've held that maybe just culture yeah. have informed me. Well, let's actually see how the resolution happens, yeah? So they've gone through this process. There's this, these, these things that, 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 that Jared mentioned. Let's go, skip down to verse 24. Mm -hmm. And Israel, can you read from 24 to 29 for us? Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. 
farewell. So this is the conclusion of the matter. Kind of translate this for us, guys. Callie, what's going on here? What's the resolution of the matter? Uh, the resolution is to send a letter out to everyone that it affects mm -hmm. and saying, like, okay, we talked about it. We mm -hmm. understand what's going on. And I love they send, they send Paul and Barnabas in verse 26, men who have risked their lives in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They've mm -hmm. been tested. You can trust them, we promise. Mm -hmm. And then they give the practical things at the end. Verse mm -hmm. 20 and 29, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these three things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love how they phrase it there. Um, like, we have seen good to us to lay upon you nothing else except for this. And I think it emphasizes the freedom that God gives us because a lot of times we do see things as do's and don'ts and, like, okay, follow this really long list. But it's like, yeah, we talked about it, prayed about it, and just these things. Everything yeah. else is fine. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the Garden of Eden, of out of all these trees you may freely eat. It's not this Eat one. everything you want except yeah. for this one little thing. It's one thing. There, there, are, one there thing. are some principles here, right? Because you have idolatry, you have sexual immorality. These are things that were endemic to the Gentile world, so they're hearkening back to the Ten Commandments, and you also So were have Gentiles known for idols and blood and sexual immorality? Was that, was that, so where, where's the overlap, I'm asking? I think it's part of just the world. Okay. Like this kind of, it's not even, maybe not even, it probably is affecting the people there, but like in general, we're going to expand this ministry a lot, yeah. and we'll encounter these kinds of things, and mm -hmm. so we're just going to kind of set this up. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, yeah. all right. And the laws right. of Moses had these principles in them. You yep. know, that we ought to eat a certain way. We ought to behave in a certain way with, uh, you know, our, our sexual relationships. These were things that were, that the laws of Moses were pointing to in principle mm -hmm. and not just in custom. Mm -hmm. How, and we're going to take a step back here, and what are some general principles we can take from this chapter? And we can apply them to modern day context. What, what would be I think, for me, the one thing is, don't test God. Right here it says, you know, as you're doing this, your debate, the issues that you've risen yeah. are not issues that you're, you're not testing each other, you're testing God. Okay. And so when it comes to the church, let's not test God by finding ways to make people live our own religion. That's yeah. the takeaway that I get from okay. this. Okay. My takeaway for this is that when the church gets together and there's big issues, it's because there's good stuff happening. It's, these are growth pains, growing pains that are going through. So when you see that the church is going through conflict, let's ha take a higher standard and say, hey, what are the larger principles involved? Have a clear eye, pray for the Holy Spirit. Well, this is the prayer of uh, the panel here. Hopefully that's your prayer. It is mine. We'll see you next week on Inverse.